keeping it. Hmm? Oh, no. Oh, you go now. Yeah, the gym of the surface hub. Um, for anyone who is waiting, we're just getting ourselves settled. Um, so stay tuned. We'll uh, round people up. Yeah. Um, I almost thought, like, <coughs> how could I bring that into here and do that mm. here and pass that there? Yeah. To the studio away. Yeah. Oh, I um I went in to see one of those at um Lowell Oh yeah. Pricey. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> um, oh, well, she told us the price. No. Yeah, top end, something like eight grand. Or yeah, it was like five. Five was the cheapest, right? Mm. Like eight was the top end. And, and I, we're streaming too, David. So yeah. be careful what you say uh, as we're getting people in. Um, uh, what was what you were shopping for? Surface Studio. Yeah, oh, we just yeah. had it in as a. As a uh, demo as part of a day. I remember saying that I thought the um, the specs were a bit funny, like, as in like thinking that the RAM doesn't really kind of match up with what's available. But I was wrong when I saw the specs. Right. But they do go up to it's definitely a 16 gig model. I think it was a 32 yeah. gig. Because well. minimum now really is at least eight, if not 16. Yep. Yeah. Otherwise, what's four is just still. Yeah, uh, no, it was four gigs of video RAM, wasn't it? Graphics card memory. Oh, is that it? Yeah. yeah, I think so. Maybe that was it. Yeah. Um, my son, what did he get? He he thought he'd buy one online, but he returned it because mm. he just didn't. Well, uh, round up people, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's um, Ellen's box, um, and you you sent in a uh, yeah, streaming I've got, I've too, got one right here. Did you? Um, I've got one on the. I've got a copy of it on yeah. here. It's just one slide. So oh, okay. So um, we just jumped out of there. Let's do this. Do that. Of course, that's not going to work now because I just unplugged uh -huh. it. That is correct. Yeah, we'll do it. Ah, uh, you need one. And then a, a little mini hub. <laughs> or Bluetooth mouse. That's where we've got all the Bluetooth mice are easy to retrain so they can just kind of walk about. They are more of cows. They're all on screen up there, by the way. This one. No, that one. No. This one. Yeah, it's that one. There's the skills that one there. Wow, well, yeah, the thing out and put the mouse back in if you like. Yep. It should stay there with some luck. Until it resaves. That one. Not that one. These are one. Oh, I guess I'm starting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're there. The rest oh, of us just walked away. Because Nick's made himself up. comfortable. You're hiding around the corner. Right, I'm on phone duty. Oh, oh, oh right. right. Yeah. <laughs> is it last one to, to get away from the keyboard? Is, is yeah, it? Right. Pretty much. Yeah. Uh, welcome to, to everyone who um, managed to see our, our last minute. Uh, hey, we're running the meetup. Um, yeah, but I think this is working out for us doing it that way because uh, I was discussing with the. Uh, uh, the guy here earlier, sometimes when we, we uh, put out the word a month earlier, people go, yes, 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 and then closer to the time, yeah. <laughs> Honestly. 
I mean, the worst we've had is like 100 people so RSVP and about 20 people showed up. So <laughs> so like, yeah. So you can imagine like buying pizza for 100 people and like 20 people showed up. <laughs> pizza for leftovers? Yeah. yeah anyone? Leftovers. Yep. Right, yeah, so we, we do have a, um, a good couple of sessions we had planned. It's actually sadly been whittled down to one and some freestyling. So we're going we're gonna to be doing a, a few things with you. So let's just say it's going to be an interactive kind of session. Um, uh, yeah, so Aben had a session planned to do app services, wasn't it? Right? Yeah. He had a family emergency which pulled him away, so unfortunately he couldn't make it tonight yeah. to do that. But if you're still very interested in app services and you literally came along yeah. to that tonight, we can still wing something. Um, otherwise, we are yeah, keen to open it up to the Who is here for app services? Anyone want to know about app services in Asia? Okay, we won't tell Aben. <laughs> Actually, no, we'll tell Aben that the whole room was here for. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah that's what we're doing. Right. Sweet, so we just open it up for ideas then. When we get Aben, to the there were tons of hands. <laughs> um, yeah, okay, so we'll, we'll win that. Um, but we do definitely have um, uh, Alan's session that he, he ran at the Azure Bootcamp, which was a successful event. Um, congrats to all the, the organisers. Um, around uh, cognitive services and some sentimental analysis. <laughs> um, so uh, we do have a couple of other things we're going to slot in there. I think we'll, we'll um, look to, to Regan to get um, his uh, little message out of the way. Um, that is uh, yours there, Regan. Sure. Right. So uh, who likes free money? Yeah, yeah <laughs> pretty much everyone. <laughs> um, so uh, we're running a promotion at the moment uh, here at uh, Microsoft New Zealand. Um, it's actually kind of running globally, but New Zealand's got some extra special bits and pieces added in. Um, it's around Azure Skills. There is a site that's been launched with some online courses, so you can go and sign up for this site, um, openedx.microsoft.com, um, and there's a whole bunch of courses up there. Um, apparently the Azure Day, I'm not sure what that is, but Azure Skills page is, uh, uh, should be up there, and there should be a whole lot of online courses around Azure for infrastructure, Azure for developers, um, and also Azure for data science and some other bits and pieces. So if you're interested in learning a bit more about Azure um, mm -hmm. and, and going a bit deeper in the technologies and stuff, um, there's some great online course material there for you. Um, there are some exams as well that you can sit and you know, there's some information that's around and if you go to this partner to Microsoft.com to Azure Skills, just ignore the partner bit, it's, uh, you know, um, it's relevant everywhere. Um, but that'll tell you a bit more about the exams and which exams is which. Um, and there is actually the ability to buy a package for a single exam with practice tests for, for in US dollars 99, um, or a three exam package with practice tests and, and free retakes for 279. Um, so if you're into doing the actual exams and certifying, um, then there's that offer there as well. And then uh, the last bit, which is kind of the exciting free money bit, uh, this one here, uh, we have at the moment a offer where the first 100 people to complete one of these MOOCs, an email this address, which you can't read from back there, but don't worry, the, 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 um, the slide deck will be uploaded somewhere, so you can grab a copy of the slide. Um, but if you complete one of these MOOCs and then show email the completed, um, the, the screen that says that you completed the MOOC, um, and you're one of the first 100, of which there's still a few left, um, then you can get a $50 non-leaving voucher for doing that. Cool. So, free money, sort of. You gotta do a bit of work for it, but it's, <laughs> it's worth doing. Uh, and then if you actually go and do one of these exams, pass that before the 30th of June, whatever, um, we do have uh, a couple of Surface books up for grabs. So, um, you know, I, I don't know, if 100 people go and sit an exam and pass it, then you know, you'll have a, a 2 in 100 chance or a 1 in 50 chance of winning a Surface book just by doing that. So, um, if you study and then set the exam, then also email your copy of your exam transcript and go in the draw to win a service spot, which is pretty awesome. Is that um, for New Zealand or is that scope to the world? This is just New Zealand. Just New Zealand, your not the world. Your chances have increased. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, uh, yeah. Is that the online exam or the... Um so the surface book is the actual exams where you sit the test, so you actually have to spend your 99 bucks or if you've got free exam vouchers from somewhere, you'd have to use one of those. Um, the $50 vouchers is for completing the completely free online MOOC. So you don't have to pay anything um, or sit. To, uh, Halfway through. Yeah, you just got to complete the, um, the online course and, and email. And, um, yeah, so you have to do a little bit more for the surface book, but you know, the odds 
Um, you know, I, I don't know how many people are going to sit that exam, but you know, if 100 people sit it, you've got pretty good odds of winning one of those two service books. So it's, it's not bad. And you'll come out with some skills anyway. <laughs> that is the point, right? Which is the point. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so make sure you go and tell everybody about this. Or, or not, if you, <laughs> if you just want to get those odds down. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, that's, that, that's up there and it's ready to go. The, the slide for this is on the USB and Daryl's got it, so you should be able to pop it on the, um, on the meetup site afterwards in case you want to go and grab it and grab the email addresses and the, and the links and things. Cool. Yeah, thanks, Reese. Cool. cool. Um, do you want to a couple of housekeeping stuff as well? Yeah, 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 because we're good like that. We um, cover off the important stuff at the end of the event, like, <laughs> like how to, to find the fire. toilets yeah. and what to do in a fire. Yeah, yeah. so we do have um, a couple of keys that will, will get you past the door or back in, um, because now that it's after hours, the door is closed, and we do want you to come back in. <laughs> so uh, uh, the men's are on the HP side of the elevator, and the ladies are on the, the other side. Um, right, the other side of it was if there's a fire. We, have we actually ever done We've it? never said that. No. <laughs> we probably should. Regan, Why tell us. <laughs> Where should we go? go uh, well, there's an exit right there if you can get past the little surface hut. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think we should probably move, we'll move that. Uh, otherwise, uh, <laughs> out past reception, then there's two stairwells either side of the elevators that you can take. Brilliant. Okay. Cool. Well, I, don't, service up there, right? I don't think you can open the windows here, so don't try that. No. <laughs> you doing a demo later? Like uh, no, it's actually got a do not touch thing Oops. on there, so I'm, I'm not allowed to, unfortunately. Otherwise, I would have. Mm. It's not bad. Nice risk. Now, um, uh, we do have another uh, announcement and, and something of a giveaway tonight. Um, there is the Digital Workplace Conference coming up in a couple of weeks' time. The date there is the, the 23rd of May. A um, couple of people here who, who run the, the user group are speaking there too. Alan's there. I managed to slot in a, a late session myself. Um, and it's, uh, it's usually uh, scoped around productivity, um, around the, the Office 365 space, as, as it suggests, a digital workplace. I think they do run a little bit of developer stuff, don't they? Little? A little, a little bit. It yeah. was like an office graph. Business, business like track, um, IT Pro <laughs> track, <laughs> semi-developer sort of track. Um, we've do got, we do have some um, significant case studies stuff. track as well, which is one of the most popular. It is, actually I really, I really enjoyed um, um, the Provoke case study last, last oh, year. Yeah, that was at Unitech. Yeah. yeah. Lots of really cool which, which stuff. Which is the uh, solution we won the uh, award for. Oh, That's really? Cool. How about that? Yeah. Oh, right. well done. <laughs> yeah. Um, we do have a couple of internationals coming across, too. Does anyone know Christian Buckley, Mike Fitzmorris? Actually, am I talking to an Office 365 audience or a developer audience? or? A yes. 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 <laughs> <laughs> right. yes. Coffee or tea? <laughs> yeah. All right. So yeah, we do have a, and uh, yeah, a bunch, a bunch of really good speakers that are coming across. So um, DB Island, who helps to put or organises the conference, um, uh, kindly gives each of the user groups a, a ticket to uh, to give away. So we'll have a um, a uh, skill question, or rather, a, a kind of an interactive way of, of helping to get to that winner. Um, it's not as simple as spell DWC, but um, yeah. So how much does that ticket worth? I should mention that, yeah. So um, registrations are still open. Um, it is, let me go, here's our dollar value somewhere here. So early bird was 900. One grand, Full two-day right? two course is 1,050 plus GST. And it is, it is packed, right? You will come away with some, some inspiration, um, <laughs> some more than just tips. You'll be able to go and um, really dive deep into Know, digitizing your your workplace so yeah definitely well worth it and very generous of, of Debbie um, so yeah we'll, we'll uh, I will mention it there is a, a, a part in um, Alan's uh, presentation that is, is going to involve grabbing a few people and we're going to analyze your face <laughs> we're gonna yeah we're gonna um, try and yeah. So yeah, sh shall we say um, yeah? So so part of it is cognitive services can look at your face and see if you're happy or sad or angry or whatever. So sure, I'm sure Alan will tell us, haven't we? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll let him we'll let him reveal the. Yep. Problem. Yep. Exactly. We'll get we'll definitely yeah. get into those details. So <laughs> um, if uh, if you do um, 
you know, have, have some spare time on those two days too and you're quite keen on this, this area of content, you work in this space, then I really do encourage it. I've been along a few years now and I've always got a, a lot out of it, not just from the sessions but the networking and, and meeting people as well. All right, uh, yeah, back to this. We are modeling a number of different lazy ways that um, IT pros can work and I didn't email my presentation, I'm running it from my browser. We are also running, um, or trying to run, something now called Bing Pulse. Um, if you've been along to, I think Ignite did it last year, and there's a couple of other events that have done this too. Um, it's a way of being able to, one, sort of show in a sentiment um, in the way that you, how do you feel the speakers are going? Do you agree or disagree? Um, there's all sorts of different ways you can configure it. We've also got a couple of, and I should release the, uh, should start the, uh, start the uh, Bing Pulse because you'll probably get there and it will not have anything there but we can have a look at some of the confirm. have a look at some of the results later good thing is that it's a, a free service and it's a good way of um, engaging the audience getting you know how, how are things going in a live kind of set, in a live kind of way and I can release polls as well so I've got a couple of polls that I've released during Alan's presentation um, around some of the questions that, he, that he's um, going to be asking. So uh, do keep that open and um, when you feel he's doing a great job, give him a thumbs up. Um, yeah, I'll leave the rest to you. <laughs> so uh, we do have a, a couple of slots where we do like to try and cover off um, various different news and it's certainly not an, um, uh, an insult to your capabilities of reaching out and finding this stuff for yourself, but I think that it really helps to to bring it all together and talk about what's what's new and what's happening. Um, how's that been Pulse looking? Um, up? No, no buttons have shown. You actually had April last year, uh, last time. Okay, I think Regan's got it going. That's all right. Oh, okay. Um, so yeah, uh, for for Azure news, uh, we're looking to yeah, Nick yeah. to to drive that. Oh, it's yeah, and as, as Daryl mentioned, like sometimes you just miss things as well. So it's a uh, yeah, good opportunity to kind of cover things off. Um, so yeah, I, I spent a little while looking through news over the last month to try to find some Azure news and didn't actually find all that much. <laughs> so yeah, but I wonder why exactly. Yeah, so there are little bits and pieces which are kind of boring, not really worth talking about here. Um, and I think the reason for that is because of this. So Microsoft's um, Bill conference is on tomorrow morning. Tonight. So, yeah, well, they're on. Uh, so yeah, it's like in previous years, there's been a lot of announcements um, released at Build, a lot of new cool features and services and all that sort of stuff. So I reckon there's a bit of radio silence on Azure News is uh, probably because of this. <laughs> what time is it here then? Glad you asked him. So it is at. <laughs> <laughs> is anyone planning to attend? <coughs> 3 a.m. New Zealand time. It kicks it's off. It's not fun at all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, so bright and early tomorrow morning. Uh, Are you going to be here? Am I going to be attending? In that? Yeah. Uh, here? Oh, you're like a live party? No. Yeah, we're, not doing it. we're not doing it here at 3 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> you can do it at your browser and do that for yeah. your pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> Is that right? We, we have done build viewing parties in the past, but 3 a.m. is a bit of a shitty time to do that. Yeah, so it's a bit nuts. <laughs> yeah. You can join in at any time. Yeah, you, you, can, you can start watching the stream delayed if you want to get up and do it at 6 a.m. Or yeah. you can just jump to Twitter and see all the. Yeah, I mean, it's a couple of days long, right? So it's not like uh, blink and you'll miss it sort of thing. But jump in there and, and have a look. Uh, it's going to be exciting, I think. It's, it's, I look forward to it. It's one of Microsoft's big conferences each year. You know, there's what, like two or three big ones? This one, Ignite, and... So th this one is more tended towards the developer audiences, hence yeah. the name Build. Um, <coughs> but, you know, there will be some infrastructure and, and office stuff that's probably... Yeah, there and there's, well. I mean, there's a lot of crossover stuff in Azure these days as well, you know, so even if you're an infra guy, you still start using it, you know, you maybe you focus on developer stuff, so yeah, definitely, definitely some infrastructure stuff coming. Definitely, Irene's got the, got the heads <laughs> up. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, next, next round we may even have a best of build announcements, yeah, we'll see, some idea for, for next month. Um, 
So you got off light, didn't you? I did kind of get off a bit light, but luckily there were a few interesting announcements lately. Uh, Surface Laptop got announced, was it last week? Somewhere like that? Yeah. So that's pretty cool, a new device in the Surface family. Um, it's the kind of most traditional looking device. All the other ones had like detachable keyboards and fold back things and the big you know, Surface Studio that goes on with the lever thing and the Surface Hub that's over there. Um, yeah, so the Surface Laptop is kind of the most normal looking laptop sort of device um, that is in the Surface line. Um, and it's and uh, what do, what makes it special? Mate? What makes it special? Oh, glad you asked, Daryl. That's what makes it special. Um, so yeah, I mean, just just run over. It's uh, yeah, it, it, it's good for uh, sort of all your purposes. Really, it was kind of inspiring for for students. Um, so kind of taking target at that Chromebook-ish kind of target market. Yeah, it's that's not, this one's probably not targeting the Chromebook. Not this one exactly, yeah. I mean, there's other other manufacturers, think like yeah. Dell and HP and that, that are making, what's it, like $200 US devices? Yeah. Um, yeah, that'll be running Windows S, Windows 10S. Yeah, we'll what's the S stand for? Well, Student that's, um, Surface? yeah, <laughs> very, various <laughs> different meanings. So various security, um, <laughs> so stability, <laughs> stability, <laughs> store. Yeah. Okay. Students. Student, yeah. 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 But yeah. but there is there is I mean it will ship with Windows ten S, but it can be upgraded to Pro. Yeah. Um the, the thinking behind Windows ten S is um that you only install Windows store apps. But Regan um showed me I think it was the very the following day after the announcement, there's a a program or a platform <coughs> called um Centennial. Yeah. Is it Centennial name? is the mm -hmm. program and, and basically it allows you to wrap a Windows 32 app so that you can serve it up through the store um, and then deploy it through the store and update it through the store. Um, so, you know, picture WinZip, for example, if you wrap the installer up with this, then you'll be able to then download WinZip through the store. Um, and one of the things that the store does is it, it basically vets apps mm. for you. Um, so, hopefully, you're going to have less chance of downloading some dodgy XE and installing it and, and having one of those uh, ransomware screens <laughs> pop up on your machine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, and yeah, the Windows 10 <coughs> SKU only allows apps that have come through that store. Um, but uh, as was mentioned, the, um, the, the there is a way to upgrade it for 50 US dollars, uh, I think is the cost. Mm -hmm. uh, for the Surface Laptop, I think they're doing it free at mm -hmm. least for the next year. Yeah, yeah for the first year. Um, but yeah, the main, the, the main thing around Windows 10 S is that if you've got people that you don't want to be letting loose and installing any, you know, anything, <laughs> they can, grandmas, parents, all that sort of stuff, <laughs> kids maybe, yeah. Um, it's a good secure <coughs> environment for them because it'll be kept up to date with um, antivirus and Windows um, and it'll block out you know, potentially all of those apps that run in a high privilege. Yeah, so a bit more curated experience rather than just letting you loose and do what you want. Kind of like. I've heard it's um, still run Office. <coughs> yes. Yeah, so Office, mm. Office uh, there, is, there are two versions of Office. There's a Windows app version of Office, um, the UWP version, and they are also building out the full Win32 Office which will be able to be um, deployed by the store for these machines. Regan, I guess a question I have too around that. I've heard that Windows S, um, what's the saying, that the the laptop's supposed to run as, as clean as it is the day that you get it because these apps are supposed to be very compartmentalised. So can you tell us a bit more about that? Uh, yeah, so when you're, when you're deploying apps from the Windows Store, they will go into their own folders, they will have their registry kind of virtualized in those folders, so um, you know, they can't go outside of that environment. Um, if you're installing 10 different apps, they each have their own dependencies, they don't all depend on the same stuff. Uh, so you know, from that point of view, you're not going to have apps clashing and things breaking because you uninstalled one and then the other one breaks, uh, all of those kind of old problems that used to have. Stuff during boot time as well, right? So you don't have these random little EXEs yep. trying to run while you're booting your machine. <coughs> that yeah. all stays very clean. Very and, and because yeah. Yeah. <coughs> and because of the way that Windows is optimized, uh, et cetera, for um, deployment on the disk and for sitting in memory and running the background, uh, all of those go into this as well. So the, the, the new OS has got some extra tweaks mm. around all that sort of stuff. Cool. Yeah. So cool. you can see why it's, it's really well suited for the education space. Um, you know, for control and for just making sure that when students come in the classroom that they're not fiddling around trying to get things to work, it's all standardised. Mm. And if you, if you go into a, a primary school and you only need a, a slimmed down version of Windows without all that extra stuff on there, yeah, and you go and you buy your um, 
Chromebook competing Windows laptop for <laughs> super cheap. Um, one of the advantages though of having S on that is that maybe when you get to high school if you're still using the same device, um, you can then upgrade that to full Windows um, if, if you need that for, uh, for other things. We do have a, a, a question from the audience, an online audience. Oh, and um, Aben does say that he is joined too and sorry he didn't make it. <laughs> um, so uh, Sebastian Zhang is asking about um, is Windows 10 S like an upgraded version of Windows RT and that comparison has been made, what's the difference? So Windows 10 S um, is basically the same as Windows 10. Um, as soon as you go and buy a code and upgrade it, you're running Windows 10 the same as anybody else. Um, Windows RT was running on a different hardware platform. Um, you could not physically run the Win32 apps and things on there, so you couldn't just drop a key in and, and upgrade it. So it's quite quite different in that sense. It's not um, it's not locked down. It's not restricted by hardware. Um, it's it's basically just restricted by the OS itself. Um, so yeah, you. You could um, yeah, pop that code in and be running for Windows in, in minutes. Cool. Same, same cool. code base, same update base, etc. Um, no and confusion. in fact, you can kind of simulate Windows 10 S on your current Windows 10 if you've got one of the latest editions going into the setting and changing a setting that says run store apps only. Oh, and that'll okay. block exes from. Um, it won't, it doesn't, yeah, permanently do everything like S does because mm -hmm. you can still so just a question. hang out of that. Will it come as a DVD, as an ISO, or is it only for... Windows 10S? Yeah. Um, good question. <laughs> I'm not too sure. Um, it, it's, it'll be shipping on OEM devices. I'm not sure if it'll come as, a, as an install your own um, DVD ISO. Uh, all the other versions of Windows are able to come down as, as ISOs. Um, I'm not sure about S at this stage. You could see it being useful in that mm. sense, having a computer yeah. lab and just grabbing that, that lockdown version of Windows to, to roll out. Yeah. The related question is about the price of it. There's mm -hmm. been no price mentioned for this. For 10S? Yeah. Yeah. No, there's no, there's no price mentioned at this stage for, the, for buying the OS. Mm. Um, there was a price mentioned which was 50 US dollars to upgrade from 10S to full Windows. Yeah, which is pro. Yeah, so I don't. Yeah, I don't know whether there'll be a SKU that you can go buy, or whether it'll be an OEM one, or any of that at this stage. The way it's just free. Mm -hmm. Free. Oh. Well, that'd be kind of cool, but mm. who knows? <laughs> yeah. So oh, yeah. Windows 10 S is that the creator version mm -hmm. or? Uh, yes. Uh, so Windows 10 S is available from Creators Edition upwards. Uh, it is the same version of Windows as Pro and Home and Enterprise, um, just a, 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 like a, a more restricted. Um, execution policy, so you can't run you know, full trust applications. One thirty. Is that the only that. restriction? No, is, it, is it really just oh, can you run store apps or not? Uh, I'll have to say a pass on answering that question. <laughs> Good answer. Uh, I don't. Yeah, I don't yeah. know if there are other restrictions in there. I'm guessing. Yeah, there are. Yeah. A few. Yeah. I mean, there's restrictions that you don't get in. Um, home edition that you get in Pro and, and, and things that you get in Enterprise that you don't get in Pro, so th there'll definitely be some of those things missing. So no, you, um, can't, you can't domain join a Windows machine? No, you can't domain join it, So, yeah. but that's that's similar to Windows 10 but Home, home as well. Yeah. Um, so if you need a domain join machine, <coughs> then go to Pro. Um, but you can Azure AD join it. Azure AD so. directly yeah. join it, and you can manage it with uh, Intune or the new Intune for Education. Yeah. Edition. So it can still be managed as an organisation, it can still be um, owned by an organisation as a device, um, or you can use it as a BYOD that you just connect to your work stuff. Right, well. so for schools running Office 365, um, you can, you've got that Azure AD domain join option, um, which is yep. something I've done on my laptop as well, quite useful. It is. Mm -hmm. I run my corporate laptop on Azure AD domain join, hmm. have done for a bit over a year now, so it's pretty yeah. good. That's great. Cool. <coughs> Um, cool. Sorry? Good questions. Good questions. <coughs> um, so yeah, Surface Laptop then, <laughs> comes with Windows 10 S, you can pay an extra, I think 49 US to upgrade it to Pro if you want. Uh, those are the price points for the New Zealand market, uh, 1700 retail for the i5, uh, or students get it slightly cheaper, uh, but as Riga mentioned, there are some other devices coming out which are way cheaper than that. Um, purely aimed at that sort of Chromebook market you know, for, for students. So the students they're aiming at with this laptop are the high school leavers going into university. Stuff, so yeah. it's a laptop <coughs> that's you know going to last them through 
um, those years of study. Yeah. Sweet. Um, and that was going to be my segue into Windows 10 S, but we kind of covered that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, a couple of other restraints. So, like, with 10 S, you have to use Edge as your browser. Purely because it's the default browser. Yeah, but like, there's no Chrome or Firefox UWP app. No, but they could. So they if, could make if, one. If Google packages up Chrome <coughs> into the Windows Store, um, which is not a, it's not a difficult thing to do. Then no. Chrome could be offered through the store as well. Yeah, it's just if they do that, <laughs> slash when they do that. But at the moment, Edge is pretty much your option, unless you want to go for Opera Mini, which is I think available in the UWP as well. Hey. They could possibly install store games, right? Games. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. If it's in the Windows Store, you can install. You could. Oh, uh, mostly, games? unless it's a Holly only app or something. <laughs> you block the games. Uh, application whitelisting, I suppose. Block it. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. if you if you manage these devices with um, with Windows Intune um, or the Intune for Education, then you can block. Uh, you, you can tell your um, people that are join you know, what apps are allowed to run by policy. So you can, you can include them or block them, etc. And if you're running Windows at home, um, you sign up for Windows Family, then you can also block um, just through the, the family stuff uh, what your kids can actually run on it, and, um, et cetera as well. My kids are all well and truly locked down with it. <laughs> <laughs> Except for Minecraft, right? But the Windows, the Windows Family stuff is really good because they actually can, per device, they've got Windows phones, uh, they've got computers that they can use with yeah. an Xbox. And I can actually dole out how many minutes on every day for every single device. So, you know, awesome. I can That's get pretty awesome. 20 minutes on the Xbox, an hour on the computer, and you know, half an hour on the phone. <laughs> down to every single day yeah. individually. Yeah. My son hates it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my, my kids are starting to learn what that means as well. <laughs> cool. Uh, all right, moving on then. Um, and the last exciting announcement is this thing. So this is the uh, Hamikata Invoke speaker, oh. powered by Cortana. So um, yeah, this went public a couple of days ago on the Hamikata website. Uh, so does everyone know like Amazon Echo, with like Alexa and yeah. that sort of stuff? Yeah. So this is essentially Microsoft's version of it. Is there any indication of when you're going to be able to get the Cortana app in New Zealand or Android? Uh, on Android, I don't know what the plans are for Android. It's not with Android, so this whole like syncing of notifications between Windows 10 right, it doesn't work. and Android doesn't work because um, Cortana on the Android App Store is not available in your country. Yeah, so Cortana on the Android App Store is relatively new. Yeah. So they're probably still um, keeping the, the distribution tight while they yeah. tune it up. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure where it'll expand out further. Um, I mean, Cortana is not officially supported in the New Zealand market yet, yeah. um, but you can on Windows go and you know, choose to, to speak Australian, or uh, <laughs> English. <laughs> English, British English, <laughs> or uh, US English, and, and, and yeah. still have it work. But uh, yeah, you can't speak New Zealand. Because <laughs> otherwise, yeah, like if you're using other services, like if you're trying to use like, like I've got a Google Apps domain account and I use my email so because you can't use like Cortana and Android, it's pretty much near useless for me to use it like even on the desktop because it just doesn't really get everything linked up. Yeah, I, I would expect that, that Cortana will be open wider. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's very new in the Android store mm -hmm. at this stage. Cool, yeah, so I, I take it at Build they're going to be talking a lot more about this and about the uh, integration layer as well so this is obviously not going to be the last speaker that's going to be leveraging the Cortana capabilities um, yeah so I think Microsoft's approach is to open up to the market and get speaker manufacturers to build the speakers and then Microsoft sorts out the uh, uh, the software behind it yeah, yeah. Right. I believe it's a pretty open SDK so <coughs> if you want to go and build your own Cortana speaker yeah good. let's get into that yeah rather than uh, Amazon and Google who kind of package everything together very tightly but and available available fall 2017 so disclaimer on that later this year probably uh, spring <laughs> 2017 <laughs> yeah <laughs> so that's mobile that's first way, way, cloud way. first yeah. US, US first, first. <laughs> and us first street value uh, no uh, pricing yet no. I'd imagine it would be competitive with the, the, the Echo, Echo and the Google Home yeah well maybe a bit more because it's a home car <laughs> <laughs> 
Samsung Samsung is bought that company. Oh, did they? Yeah. Yeah. Or the IBM um, yeah, they're uh, shipping uh, Android phones with uh, Microsoft versions as well. Mm. Yeah. In the store, in your store, right? Yeah. So the uh, the killer app announced for this is Skype, though. So that's something you can't do at the moment with Google Home and Amazon Alexa. So you can actually tell the speaker to call someone using Skype. So you can use the speaker as kind of a speakerphone mm. you know, from from your living room. Uh, yeah, but since it's only coming out near the end of the year, I imagine by that stage, the other two platforms will be able to support something along those lines as well. But so you can do that on your Windows phone now. You can do it on Windows phone now, but you can't do it on a device sitting in your living room that's uh, the home assistant. My living room is an interesting place. If I walk in there and say, hey Cortana, we have seven devices. <laughs> 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 yeah. That would be awesome. <laughs> Yeah. One. I always wondered why, why Microsoft didn't actually just enable this on like Xbox because yeah, you literally yeah. have a device sitting in your living room at the moment with a speaker if you've got Connect yeah. that can do the there same sort of thing. Cortana on the Xbox on the Xbox yeah. preview that's publicly uh, out there. Yeah, but it wouldn't have this sort of capability, like the whole Amazon Alexa sort of thing. <laughs> like, yeah, you know, what's my calendar look like and what's happening tomorrow and what's the time and... San Diego or whatever. Yeah, my, yeah. Um, my Xbox is not connected to my calendar at this yeah. stage. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you so, can't tell it to launch uh, music and play music and yeah. start games. And yeah, well, it's pretty much the weather is. So yeah. All other lot standards are scheduling game time, mm. telling you to get to work because you've got some appointment. Mm. So yeah. Bring Xbox out. Yeah, very really cool. So yeah, watch the space. It's still, still a little while before it's released, but I thought it was pretty exciting. Mark's just coming to the party with the uh, home assistant sort of devices. Yeah. Cool. So he needs Abram. We've been uh, right through all this time already. Yeah, yeah that's all good. Yeah, Daryl's still got his office which is what he needs to go. Oh, yeah, I'll so always do that. Oh, there's no need to rush. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as a reminder, yep, tomorrow morning, 3 a.m., wake up early, build, watch it. <laughs> the keynotes are always good. And you will be able to download and play in the bank later if not. Yeah, they'll, it's all on Channel 9, so just get in there and we'll watch more Twitter feed when we wake up. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if I'm going to be up at 3 a.m. <laughs> Sweet. A number of Twitter friends have made an early, early morning um, announcements, yeah. Um, sometimes we, we, we have large gaps between the announcements of various figures and um, how things have been adopted. I think there was some figures that were waiting around for um, the adoption of Windows 10 as well. I think there, there was some, some good ones that came out with that. But Office 365 um, recently announced figures of 300 million active users, um, monthly active users, and they, they further defined what an active user is. So beforehand, I think the figure was 400, but now they've further defined what active users is, and they've been a bit stricter, so that's why it's come down to 300. So that's for, as it says, um, people using it for at least four hours a day, not just checking their email and you know, right. on and off and that's it, yeah. but actually using Office 365. So <coughs> that, that would include the other workloads as well, um, whether that be one, two or three. So um, yeah, that's, that's quite, quite impressive and a, definitely a good source of revenue. A um, couple of uh, things that have happened in the, the SharePoint online space. Uh, and quick question, um, how many people are using Office 365 here at work? Yep. And who are uh, kind of IT pros helping to manage or, or do things with that? So a few more. Yeah, so that's why I'll keep it reasonably short. Um, but you've probably, be, if you've been keeping documents within SharePoint um, and, or um, have had to shift to that, you might have been plagued with this really annoying thing about the length of your URL. And I thought I'd come up with something to try and illustrate this. Um, you know, I deliberately said subfolder, subfolder, yet another subfolder. And the solution is to make it longer? Yeah, well, that's right. You know, and, and someone actually asked me that. We're supposed to be making this simpler. Now, I'm uh, just giving some thought to that. Um, yeah, um, making it longer does sound like a, a bad idea because now it's like this long. I like to use hyperlinks. Um, so that you know, I'm not actually just exposing all these percentage signs and things, so people get blown away with all the characters like that. 
But um, what it does allow uh, people to do now is, um, our organisations, is to be able to bring in a folder structure that's still recognisable to them. Um, so no offence to all the SharePointers that might be listening in or people who have worked with SharePoint, um, you know, metadata is a hard slog and um, folders uh, do still reign supreme. So when you do bring that content across, people do like to see that recognisable structure. And they've had to adjust that to fit it into a 150 character limit. That sometimes means concatenate and folder names to something that's like, what the heck does that say? I don't know mm. what that says. Um, or coming up with elaborate um, project number slash codes and things to try and um, you know, make it fit in. Or alternatively, using metadata. So um, the, the long URLs, you now have up to 400 Unicode characters. Um, and I was trying to build out this imaginary large URL with a number of characters, and even that's not 400. So I didn't quite get there. Question. Yes. Has that extended to OneDrive for Business? Yeah, yes, so OneDrive for Business and SharePoint are So that's the happened same. in the last two weeks? It's been announced in the last oh. two days. I, okay. I think it'll be rolling out gradually. Uh, because you know. I had to curtail about uh, 35 documents yep. from when I got from you. Um, so it was huge. It's yeah. often the case, isn't it, when uh, a feature's uh, talked about, um, it's oh, either rolling out over the next four, four weeks or it's switched on today, or sometimes marketing gets very you know, let's get the word out quickly and it's not going to be available for the next two or three months. So, the other thing that, that was um, uh, allowed to was a couple of characters in there. That's another, uh, along the, the same kind of line of thinking. We couldn't have certain forbidden characters because that'd screw up the URL and you couldn't get it to, to go to the, to the content. Um, you know, the joke being made now that you can actually have file names that are expletives if you kind of, you know, block out the UCK or something like that um, with percentage sign and hashtags. So yeah, you can have those those in your in your list as, and folders and file names as well. Um, the um, SharePoint sites uh, have for a little while now been updated to a new modern team site. Um, the page is very much like building out a, like you could say like a um, a LinkedIn story or, or a medium post. It's, it's more about just adding content and it all becomes sequential. Um, quite a nice um, user-friendly way of creating a page. Um, so I see that that's going to be uh, quite helpful uh, for end users. But one thing that, that it didn't come out with to start with was a way of embedding lists and libraries into the page um, with what they still call web parts. So they, they are, um, they're on their way now and they look a little something like this, simplified, um, but they will be embedded in the page. And um, I guess something that I didn't add in there, there's going to be uh, some other big news next week. Um, there's um, a SharePoint virtual summit, yeah. I guess competing a bit with, no, no, it's the following week, isn't it, after build. So you've got build, then you've got SharePoint virtual conference. Um, and there'll be a, a bunch of other news that, that's coming out then too. So if you feel like getting up for another 3 a.m. conference, mm -hmm. there's another one. I yeah, think that one's a little later. That, uh, there's a, another Windows event in Shanghai. <laughs> well, Shanghai is an What's evening for us. What's that about? Are you going to a surface <laughs> event. No, no, we won't. A uh, surface event. A surface event in Shanghai on the 23rd of May. Okay, so we've already had a Surface event for a Surface laptop. Let your mind. Event, that, was. that was an education one, just slipping in a bit. With some surface. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, let, let, your, let your mind run a little with that. <clears throat> Maybe um, Surface for the back of the airplane seats. Or. Um, Exchange Online. Uh, you, we're all familiar with distribution lists. Um, some organisations go to the extent of making people owners of distribution lists. So you can manage it yourself, um, allowing people to join. And, and um, you know, that's, a, that's been a great way historically for, for giving some of that power back to um, uh, managers and, and um, support groups and the like. Um, but the, the, the direction that Office 365 are going, um, they are using Office 365 groups. And I'll just quickly go over what that is because there's still a lot of confusion because of the way it was talked about when it was first released. Um, Office 365 Groups predominantly is a group of people. It's a security object with an Active Directory. That's where it starts. And 
on the, the edge of that. Um, Office 365 will go ahead and provision different experiences for that group to use. The first one that was released was the Outlook experience, so that a, a group would get a shared mailbox, a shared calendar, or get their own team site, but it was predominantly around that email experience. Um, now, because that was the first experience people had with Office 365 groups, um, now that's what people think of when they hear that name. It's just an email thing. It now also includes Microsoft Teams. Um, it includes uh, Yammer connected groups. And so it's really about choosing your, um, the best mode of communication for your group, how you like to talk, and then you'll get all these other great features around the edges. So the natural progression for someone who owns a distribution list would be to upgrade that to an Office 365 group. Because often when we're talking about things with people within a, a DL, uh, we are attaching documents. Uh, we might have to push out a, a calendar event, and there might be other things that we want to coordinate and collaborate on too. So it, it just makes sense to have those things provisioned for that group. So you don't have to think about, oh, does this person have permission to my OneDrive? Does this person have permission to this and that? So that's the, the natural progression. Um, that's going to be uh, coming out. And you see the experience there is that uh, within Outlook Web Access, if you own a distribution list, then within the, the groups panel, you'll see some of those DLs that are available there for you to upgrade to an Office 365 group. Um, so at the moment, that's going to be an experience that you would have if you went to Outlook Web Access. Um, it won't yet be an Outlook and I, I don't know if it ever will, that one. But uh, yeah, some of these features do come through to the, the Outlook app application experience. Question? Yes. Will that extend to sharing outside the company like you can with SharePoint now? Um, yes, uh, Outlook groups um, can. Yeah, share outside the company? Yeah, there's two ways of doing it. You can either add someone as an external user who has access to the whole oh, yeah, yeah. Free, free supply group, yeah. but you can actually turn on just within the SharePoint mm. site to do sharing oh, yeah. externally right. of just individual files. Thank you. But currently you have to do it through PowerShell. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, it's still, still definitely a, a powerful feature. I use an external Office 365 group to um, coordinate uh, a medium publication that I put together with a few people. So they're all, they all get the email when I send it out, so it's very much like a DL experience um, in that sense. But we also have a shared calendar, they can all access the SharePoint site, they can access a, a OneNote notebook and we all kind of work out what we're going to be writing about and talking about in there. You can stop people doing it as well. You can, yeah. So if you don't want people doing this, you just turn off the rights to create groups and you never have permission to <laughs> Yeah, that's right. So, yeah, exactly. When when, when uh, 365 groups came out to start with, um, just like when team sites first came out, oh, this looks fun. Let's create all these groups. And because um, each one of them creates an Active Directory object, if you manage your Active Directory um, or if you go and look in your global address list, then you see all these weird and wacky names. I actually heard of a one interesting story about a school that had left it turned on and some students made a group named after the principal. So it was the principal's name at school, school domain. And because people thought, oh, but well, this looks quite official, so we'll just email that, and everything that was supposed to be going to the principal was now going to a group where all the students could go, oh, this is fun. <laughs> so there are measures in there to, as Alan said, to, to button it down, to allow a group, a specific group of people to be, um, the ones that can create groups, or you just go directly through IT. But the idea is that um, if people are wanting to collaborate and, and they're finding a lot of those restrictions within, within the IT that, that, um, that we run, that they're, they're going out and they're doing a Dropbox this and a group set and a, um, a Gmail this and that. So it's really about putting the right measures in place and, and the governance so that people can still get on and collaborate, but it's all within your walls and within your control. So you've got to find that happy medium. Um, for those who, who uh, are interested and probably um, have been using um, Yammer, yeah, finally, a feature called Edit Post has, has arrived. Um, darn it, that GIF isn't uh, playing within the, uh, the browser experience, but I did try and record something there. I went back to a, um, it's, it has been long requested, 
um, because we've been able to do it on Facebook and various other things for some time. Um, and people were so annoyed, they go, oh, I've just typed this message and now I can't correct what I just spelt incorrectly. Um, you know, business standards and the like, or um, I kind of likened it as, uh, well, if you'd said it in the room, um, then you're probably not going to be able to take your words back either. <laughs> but they did finally bring in this edit feature. And so I was trying to illustrate there, sorry I couldn't show you the animation via the, the web experience of PowerPoint, but I was able to go back to a, a post that I created in 2014 and um, change that to buy my girl guide biscuits. And um, yeah, so that's kind of, I guess, a, a bonus for having to wait so long. I can go back and correct those mistakes. <laughs> Does it notify you that it's been edited? Um, yeah, actually, look. No, I can't download this. Well, um, so can you replay it like for video by clicking it? Uh, yeah, I don't I think it's... Yeah. I'll show you a bit later if, if you're interested. But um, the, once the, you have the, edited it, you can um, go and see the versions of that. So I can see the original post. Okay. Oh. And then I can see what has been edited and how many times that person couldn't spell a certain word. <laughs> they, not, do they have the ability to move a message to a different group? No. Yeah, because no, no. mm -hmm. yep. from, from a governance perspective, the problem was you could say something and someone would reply to it, and then you go in and edit what you originally said to make their reply look different. Or remove your message, right? Yeah, so that's why it is a bit of a problem, which yeah. is why they need to show versioning and why we usually export the data out. Actually, um, if you want to see a horribly long URL, paste uh, a link from OneNote into Canva. Oh yeah, <laughs> OneNote URLs, yeah. or even those like unique <laughs> GUIs that that are saying this is my document. <clears throat> yeah, so right. That's uh, yeah, very very brief. Of I mean, there's there's always stuff coming out in three six five. I've I've tried to do a um, a regular live stream every Saturday as a I'm going into my message center and what have I seen this week usually takes me about half an hour to get through, but it's, it's actually keeping me honest. I can see what's happening in my tenant and I can go and, and um, you know, see and, and help others around that. So I, as a last word, I encourage you that if you do have that access or if it's your responsibility, check out the message center within the Office 365 tenant or even get the app on your phone, the, um, the admin app, so that you can, um, apart from changing or updating people's passwords instead of having to dial in to work and do that, you can do it from your phone. But you can also go into that message center and see what's happening. Um, and that's that's all from me. We're going to actually hand over to to Alan. Yeah, and um, managed to. You're right. We managed to fill in. Yeah, I think we did. Abe, <laughs> <laughs> like if you've been watching, Abe, if you're still there, there, we did miss you. <laughs> And I am going to be releasing some of the polls. There's two two polls um, during Alan's question. So if you still have the the, uh, the Bing Pulse open, please use that. Where's Ben? Hmm? He did. He is taking a bit of a dive in the interesting scale. <laughs> what is? Thumbs oh, down, is it taking down a dive? Down. Thumbs down. <laughs> uh -huh. Well, let's see if I can lift this up a bit. <laughs> um, was that in response to some Office 365 updates? No one likes editing. Posts. It looks like it looks like the last ten minutes. So I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so actually, we, we thought what we're going to do in um, in this session today, and we sort of didn't have anything completely planned. So I said I'd redo part of my session that I did on cognitive services at the Azure Bootcamp because I know there was a few people who couldn't make the Azure Bootcamp because we only had a certain number of tickets. So I'm going to give it a rehash and um, add some other stuff to it as well that we didn't do at the time. Which is why um, I originally did this with Bernard, because um, at the end of the Azure Bootcamp we actually did a lab, so we got some people to create stuff and see how it works. If you feel like it along the way, you can go to some of the web pages and, and try some of this stuff out for the fun of it. Um, and I'm going to get some volunteers up later to come and do something as well. Did you tell them what the ticket was for, Rick? Yeah, so that was the Digital Workplace Conference. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> so we'll, we'll do some, um, you'll have to get up later, and um, we'll do some testing, live testing with people, and see um, whether we can win a prize. Right. Um, let's move along. Um, oh, we originally talked a bit more about creating bots and how you use some of these services for bots. So I'm really just going to focus on the services and kind of 
how these now um, integrate with both Azure and how you might use them in other applications. So let's move along. Um, so what are the cognitive services? There's actually 22 APIs, and I think actually probably since I did this presentation, there's probably 27, because um, they just keep expanding. And they're just a series of um, APIs that Microsoft have published that enable you to actually do some artificial intelligence over um, videos, images, speech, um, as well as doing the ability to be able to rich search of content, um, understand what people are saying. There's a whole bunch of them that do all sorts of different variety of things. Right? Um, now, from a vision perspective, um, there's some that are already being used um, actually by Uber. So they use the vision API to actually check that the driver is the driver who they said they are. So basically what they do when, when the driver sets themselves up, they take a series of photographs of themselves that it stores in the, the vision API. And then when the person goes to sign in, it checks to see whether they're the same person based on previous photographs. Um, and that got released recently. Um, to actually be able to add, add that into your sort of Azure tenant and um, actually use it as a live service. Um, so I've been experimenting since then to see if I can create a virtual um, front desk person to say, so when you turn up at our office, we don't need to employ a receptionist. We can just have someone, a robot say, welcome, whatever your name is, and um, I'll go tell somebody you're here. Um, but we'll be able to look up based on previous photographs that we've taken of the person. Anyway, um, so that, that's one idea of what you can use it for. The other thing is to look at um, people's feelings or emotions. Um, so understand if you've got a lot of people coming in, um, maybe to a shopping center or something like that. Maybe you want to snapshot people, see how they feel on that day. Maybe you want to change the music that's playing in the, um, in the mall because everyone's a bit um, sad at the moment. So you want to increase the mood, make people positive. So there's all sorts of things you can use it for. Um, now the speech one's um, interesting, so though, if you were um, spying on somebody and you couldn't quite work out what they were saying, you can use the speech API to remove all the rubbish out of the background and just filter down to that, what that person was saying. So if you put a microphone in a teapot accidentally and record somebody, then uh, you can make it work at the end and actually clear up all of that um, vocal. Um, but it also able to distinguish different voices. Um, it's not really as, you wouldn't kind of use it for identity as such, so it's not that kind of thing you see on um, CIS or something, but if, what's your favorite CSI, <laughs> all the other ones that um, they sort of analyze different people's voices and say, oh yeah, it's recognized as this one. Um, it's not quite like that, but um, it's more actually for yeah, cleaning up speech, identifying different people are speaking, spotting who's speaking in a room. And then maybe focusing, you could get it to pull out just one person's voice out of that, that conversation. Now, the language processing um, is about more about understanding, try, trying to infer understanding out of what somebody's actually said. I mean, as humans, we kind of, as we talk, you're sort of processing it and saying, what did he say? Yeah, I think I got that. You mentioned a couple of key things. You mentioned some dates and some times and a couple of locations. You mentioned some people. And you're kind of doing all that processing in your head, right? Um, you're also sort of translating what I'm saying into something that you understand that you can then use yourself later on. Um, so language translation is doing that for us. So it's actually taking a sentence that we say and then it's working out what we actually intended from that sentence. Right? So um, I'll show you some examples of how this actually works. Um, but it's great for if you're, um, certainly for bots. So if you're building a bot where somebody's typing just text into a text message box, and you want to work out what it was they said. It'd be really hard in code to say, did they say this word and that word and this word next to that one? You know, and actually come back and say, look, I think they intended to book a flight from Auckland to Wellington, for instance, right? just by picking out bits from um, what they've said. The knowledge one, um, I haven't delved into uh, as much, um, but the knowledge one, essentially, there's a whole set of academia um, theses and all sorts of other papers that Microsoft have, have amassed over time that you can actually use as a search engine to go through that and actually find out our results. And you can kind of think of merging these together. So you could kind of create an academia bot where you go in and ask it a question and it works out what you intended and then goes and searches the, uh, the knowledge base and comes back and says, oh, here's some theses and some citations and things like that that you might want to reference. Um, so that's really useful from that. So if you're in education, that's probably 
the area you'd be more interested in. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of search ones. So essentially, um, they've taken everything that the Bing's um, using at the back end and all of that data and created some APIs so you can quickly use those to search the web. You can search for images. You can search for, um, I mean, there's video, but there's, there's all sorts of other. There's like four or five different types of Bing APIs. There's not a map one yet. Um, they're still transferring the map one over from the old um, Bing Maps one. Um, but basically, you can yeah, search all of that content um, and just have it appear inside of your application um, without having to, to go off to Bing or get Bing to search your content. Okay. Now, the other, the other one with, um, I think it's, this, it's the search one on the knowledge one, is you can actually use it to embed it in your site and understand what people are doing in terms of searching content in your site and then infer things like, well, you were interested in this content, maybe you also want to look at this other content. So that kind of idea of creating a shopping cart sort of experience, you can use these APIs to help you sort of um, track what people are doing and then get it to make recommendations for you about what else in your website that person might be interested in, rather than you having to somehow build that, that tech as well. So a whole bunch of these um, APIs coming out. And they've gradually started moving them over into the, the Azure platform. Now they're actually, um, they're actually based on Azure, which is uh, kind of as you'd expect, but um, it's actually the base of all of these APIs is actually Microsoft's um, backend data sources. So they've got amassed a whole bunch of data sources over time, um, and then using things like um, Hadoop and other analytics engines, they can actually then mine that data and then be able to provide you with answers. So it's not just the the Bing stuff, it's like how do they know how to identify faces and, and how do they make the language recognition better? But it's because they've amassed a whole bunch of data that says this type of sentence means these things and these are the typical locations or the way people speak. Right? Um, and they're building that up over time. But you can also add your, um, your own data sources to this as well. So with these APIs, you can actually get them to, to use data that you put in. Um, so certainly from the photograph and, and identity perspective, that's one where you contribute the data. And then it uses that data as well to actually make the results better. Um, and then they're based on a whole bunch of Microsoft algorithms that they've been doing in, in Microsoft research. Um, and in fact, you can tell it was a lot of it came out of Oxford University because the, the old project used to be called Project o Oxford dot whatever. So when you go into Visual Studio and you add it, it's called Project Oxford something. Um, which is kind of where all the research came out of originally. Um, but there's a whole bunch of open source stuff in there as well that they use. Right? And it's all just built on the, the um, entire stack. Then they use um, machine learning, and they built a whole bunch of models and things like that. So actually using the Azure machine learning as part of creating the cognitive services themselves. So it shows a very good example if you use machine learning. This is what you potentially could create. Um, so they've just created all that stuff for you, so you don't have to build all of that um, knowledge in the background to be able to work out what somebody's saying. And then you get these um, wrapped up into these cognitive services, um, which are all those APIs. And then they've also created the bot um, framework alongside that, so you can, which is a, a common use case for cognitive services, to be able to quickly hook the two together and say, um, when somebody's typing a message in my bar, I'm going to go and analyze what text they said. I'm going to pull that in, work out what results I want to show them. Maybe I'll do a search and pull that back. Yeah? Uh, so, like, like one of the issues we have is um, we have to classify documents. Yes. Like, could we process a Word document through that and come back and say, this is a legal document? Or is it just, like, can we identify terms and get a concept or a whole lot of terms? So, you can get concepts and phrases, but you can't send a huge amount of text at the oh, moment. Okay. So it's not designed to send a whole document and analyze the whole document, but you can send a series of paragraphs and then work out whether, you know, if it took the first par few paragraphs or the paragraphs of the executive summary and then work out what the document was about from that, but not the whole document. Yeah, and then put a bit of text through it or something. Or yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. So you can come back and get key phrases, you can get the sentiment of the document or the text of what they said. Um, so you can analyze the Twitter feed, for instance. And, and you can do this with Flow as well, right? So you can create, everyone's heard of Microsoft Flow, hopefully it's heard of Flow. Um, so you can create a Flow that monitors a Twitter feed for certain hashtags like, um, I'd like free nuggets. Did everyone hear about this? Yeah. So, and then you could get it to analyze all the free nuggets 
things that are coming through, send it off to the sentiment analysis and see whether everyone's positive about free nuggets or negative about free nuggets <laughs> and what it was like over time during the, the whole process. And probably Flow would then charge you a fortune for processing 34 million tweets about nuggets, but yeah. <laughs> um, that's a concept you could go for. Um, so, built on the Azure stack, using Azure data. This is a nice picture of Nick. Hi. Um, <laughs> and Nick, Nick took this picture of himself at Microsoft when we were out there for the MVP summit in yeah. the visitor center. The visitor center in Seattle. Yeah. Uh, should we call you A707 from now on? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah that's my idea. <laughs> and it's called, the, it's called the Intelligent Click Kiosk. Um, and all of this is using the cognitive services. So basically, you, you go up to it and um, yeah. it's using, so that one of the Vision API ones is a continuous video capture. So basically what you can do is keep capturing the video, keep sending it to the API and go, does this video include a, a face? Does it include a face? Does it include a face? And then it will send you back and say, yes, there's a face within this rectangle. And then you can go, okay, oh, that rectangle. Then you pass off that picture of that face to the cognitive services, and you say, well, what were they like? So this is, um, this is Nick's um, neutral face. <laughs> <laughs> That's his happy face. Yeah. Um, so it's pretty amazing how it got me bang on as well, right? Well, 35 male neutral. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit yeah, older, eh? Than, uh, so, Alan, <laughs> yeah. why, why are we using Bing Pulse? Why haven't you just got this pointing at us? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, well, I haven't got the... Um, I haven't got the yeah. <laughs> Smile! <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, if you... If, I mean, we could... I can turn it around and point it later. Um, and it will tell me how many faces are in the room. Um, Whether that and then I could, it, I could take <laughs> each of the faces, pass those off to the um, face API and, and, and analyse all of them and it will tell me the average age of people in the room, how many people are female, how many people are male, um, age group, yeah, so whether they're all happy, sad, that sort of thing. Okay. Um, so all of that's possible. So if there's two people who turn up at reception, they can say, oh, welcome both of you. Um, I'll just look up who you both are. Um, anyway, so, and then they just, you know, push this through, I don't know, and they use Power BI or, or something else at the bottom. But essentially, um, this is just the data over the last, um, hour, so it doesn't keep all of the data forever. Um, it's just keeping a few people that come through. Um, so you can see the average age of people to visit Microsoft is um, in the mid 30s. Um, Marvin and like me in my 40s, and um, that's about right. There's some people in their 50s. It's okay. Um, now, interestingly, they find that, and I, and I think it's something to do with our facial expressions, that we have more. Um, ways to do anger and contempt and disgust and you know, we screw our faces up. Whereas there's only two ways to be happy about something. <laughs> you're either happy or you're surprised and then the only two good things and then everything else is like there's, there's 50 ways to be but sad about something. Um, so when you when you use the API it goes hey there's two like tracking on happiness and surprise and like six or seven results of what else you might possibly be which is sad and boring whatever else. Anyway, so powered by um, cognitive services. So you could do this in all sorts of places. You can imagine you know, look, looking at real crowd statistics um, as people are walking around, maybe in a museum, maybe they're going up to a new exhibition and you want to take <coughs> photographs and see how people are reacting to that new um, um, yeah, layout or exhibition you've got in a store or something. You know, If you've got a new storefront, um, you can imagine the next time you go to Smith & Co is at the Christmas um, thing when they got all their stuff on. You know, was this a better one? Was this window better than this one? You could have a competition in the staff um, because people will buy if well, this window is better than that one. And you can reward the staff for the, for the actual results of people's reactions. The Microsoft Visitor Center is doing pretty well. So yeah, if everyone's mostly happy. So mostly so happy. So there's a couple so. of people. Are just, <laughs> um, <laughs> don't, don't like the exhibits too much. Maybe they were fearful of it. Could be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, they were sad because they thought they were like 60 when they were actually right. Um, <laughs> so, so the next few minutes, I'm going to actually just show you a few little demos that I kind of chucked together that, that kind of show you the principles of this and some things to get you started if you really want to play. I think in the most part for me, it was trying to understand what's sort of possible and think up some ideas and scenarios of where this might apply. Um, and then you can go back and look really clever and tell people, hey, I've got this great idea, we can use this. Um, 
and just jump in the other one. Yeah, so, I just saw that as I release the polls, you probably won't see them on the phone unless you scroll up. So if you're happily clicking away at the um, thumbs up, thumbs down, <laughs> Alan's polled questions are a little further down the page. Yeah. Thanks, Alan. Sorry. Yeah, right, 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 right. Um, now, um, this used to be the uh, web page up until about three days ago, and I went in this morning to go and look at it, and it's, it's moved to Azure, um, which, is, which is a great thing, because that's kind of where it should be. Um, but it used to be its own website. Um, so you used to go in here and you could sign in and sign up with your Microsoft Live account. Now you, when you sign up, it knows your, an, your Azure account and knows your subscription and everything else, whereas this was sort of on the, on the site. So when you go to the website, it doesn't look like this now. It looks different to that, that screenshot. But it, you can still go to microsoft.com slash cognitive and it will take you to the right place. Right. Just so you know. There is still a free tier for most of the stuff, isn't it? <laughs> yes. And um, I noticed all my demos crashed um, <laughs> when I went to test them. It said, oh, you don't have the right um, key. I'm like, I don't know, I have the right key. It was a free key. Because when it transferred it all into the Azure piece, it changed all the keys. Uh, um, don't know why. So I had to go back and find all my keys again and then just change, update all my demos. Probably to make you go for a preview to GA. <laughs> yeah, something like that. There's a bunch of these have been GA'd. Yeah, yeah, they have. Yeah, so that's probably why. Anyway, um, so if you go to it now, it's it's in the, the Microsoft Azure kind of as, as you'd expect. Um, and if you scroll down, it gives you a quick demo of like, so um, if you send this through, it's going to say there was four faces in it, um, and uh, these are the rectangles. So this is saying there's one that's top left, one on four by two one two, and it's this height and width. So you can then draw the rectangle into the image and then display it. Um, and then it tells you the scores. So um, what they've forgotten to do here, which is what I did in my first demo, was multiply it by the uh, factor. <laughs> so you multiply that by 0 0.9, and that's 0 0.015 something. <laughs> but right. you can still see that happiness is the biggest number there. Yeah, it's, the, it's bigger than the, 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 um, the other ones, because it's 0 0.9. No. Yeah, so you like if you don't bother taking these you know, decimal points off, you think, well, I'm not angry. And you go, oh yeah, sorry, I'm at the decimal point, like nine steps to the right or whatever it is, um, which I managed to fix up. Anyway, so you can just go to the website and you can grab, um, you can just browse for a photograph um, of yourself, um, which is say this one, and then if you, um, it just takes a bit to see it. There's my photograph, and he goes, oh yeah, look, I found a face here. Um, it hasn't actually um, looked it up yet, I don't think. Oh yeah, I don't know, I submitted that one. <laughs> anyway, it was. Yeah, maybe you don't need to click submit anymore. It obviously doesn't do the overlay <coughs> thing. And there you go. Submit's just for the URL, right? Hmm? Submit's just for when you put yeah. the URL in. Must be. Yeah. I always just browse and upload a photograph. So I'm pretty happy in my um, company photograph. I think we should analyze all the company photographs and make, <laughs> all, make sure everyone has the right attitude. Um, see what we're going for. There's a couple of, yeah, no, most of them are happy. <laughs> yeah, um, so that, that's all cool. Um, and then you can go down and look at some of the other ones. So the, you know, these are the 22, and under each of these, when they say different APIs, it's not just like, there's a bunch here, and then when you go into them, like some of them have sub APIs and stuff as well. So there's quite a, quite a few that you can go through. Um, so that's the um, that top one there would be the emotion API. Um, the um, face API is the one that recognizes um, faces within a photograph. So they're using the two together. So you use the face API and then the emotion API. Um, so you got all the speech ones. So recognizing speech. There's a translator one as well. So you can translate speech that uh, people say. Um, so you can write your own Skype translator if you want. You download the app too. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then there's um, um, other ones. I'm going to show you Q&A Maker in a second, which is slightly different, but it's a, it's a knowledge-based one. Um, but then there's um, text analytics, which I quite like. Um, so text analytics is this one you were asking oh, about, yeah. right? So you could put a paragraph in here and then go, what does that tell me? So it tells you it was English. It pulled out some key phrases, like um, it mentioned staff, it mentioned someone had a wonderful experience, and it also mentions rooms as kind of key 
things within that sentence. Right? And the sentiment is pretty positive, it's 100%. Okay? Um, so you can mess around with it there, um, but if you, if you're like me, and uh, I decided that, well, what I could do is actually install bash, because I've got the, uh, anyone's a bash person? You can go and install bash, because there's examples at the bottom of the page you can copy and paste. Um, so I actually, um, and in fact this was done by one of the guys at Microsoft originally, so I thought I'd uh, just borrow this, his actual example. So the um, great thing about um, using this is that just with curl I can kind of send through all the details and do a quick little demo. So all I've done here is, um, oh by the way, this API is in West US. Right? Um, now we actually had a slight um, problem with one of the businesses we're working with because we're sending text to West US um, <laughs> that could possibly contain things that are personal um, and we're sending data outside of New Zealand and it was a bit of like you know, how long is it held for in the West US? Is it just processed and ditched and whatever else? So <laughs> Forever? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, so yeah, just be aware that it's not just in Australia. But eventually, I imagine the APIs will, will spread to Australia and you'll be able to say where it's hosted and then that won't potentially be a problem for you. But just be you know, cognizant of um, Now, what you can do is send through multiple documents, right? So you don't need to send through one document at a time. A document is not a document, like it's not a word document, it's just, it's called a document, but it's just like a text phrase, right, or a paragraph. Yeah, um, so you can send a thousand at a time. So I can batch a thousand into um, that call there where it's got documents and then the language and the idea and stuff. So I can create a thousand and go, give me results for a thousand, and then it comes back for each ID, it says this ID was this result and this ID was this result. So in this case, this one, and I just labeled it my doc. Um, so that phrase of this is the best demo ever, I get a score 0.956, that that is a positive statement. So um, this is now gonna be the, the worst demo ever. And I didn't change my chance, it's gonna be obvious. Um, <laughs> but it'll give me a score, so I'm, it's 0.02, right? Now that's, so it's out of one, right? So the closer to one, the more positive it is, and the, the, lower, of course, the, the more negative it is. So, um, so what you what you would do is probably have some threshold. Um, so, like if it's over 0 0.6 or something, it's probably reasonably positive below that. But you'd have to sort of, you know, look at a series of texts over time that you're analysing and sort of read it yourself and go, you know, would I give it that score or not? Did you try putting out this demo? Yeah, nah. <laughs> no. This, this is a real world problem. Uh, <laughs> I had somebody trying to analyze um, transcripts of call center conversations oh. Oh. <laughs> in the Kiwi Conflict Center, and uh, yes, this comes through. <laughs> Point seven. Point seven seven. Well, really, it's wrong because yeah, no, nah, it's kind of. <laughs> Is that, is, that, is that led with yeah, that uh, it, it gives a higher score? Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. yeah, no. yeah. No, no, yeah. No, no, yeah. We, we need to be able to select the yeah. New Zealand locale. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe, maybe he doesn't understand nah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah might not. Anyway, sorry to derail you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, right, um, so coming out of that. Um, so, other, other ways you could use this, so actually, um, there's a guy at the back of us who was coming for Power BI, so there's a bit of Power BI here, because um, he thought it was today, it's yesterday. Tomorrow, it's tomorrow. <laughs> He's not listening now, he's busy. I'm trying to Power BI! <laughs> 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 right, he's busy, right. Um, so what, it, what you can actually do is call um, these APIs actually from Power BI to complement your data. So what I did is I took um, Provoke's um, Yammer data. This isn't February this year, by the way. This is actually February last year. We're much more positive now. The office is brilliant. <laughs> um, so, um, so anyway, I took every single message that comes through in Yammer that people have posted and sent it through the sentiment analysis and then do a kind of averaging across both months and you could get down to days and stuff like that and see how positive people are and what they're talking about. Um, so in this one, actually, um, you can see that Auckland is 
only 0.4%, we wasn't very happy with our offices. So this is really good data for the company to use to decide to move us to wonderful location that's just down the road. Um, Dotacom would have had similar data, hey? <laughs> um, and then Manila, they were doing all right. Uh, their office is okay. And Wellington was quite positive about, about how they were feeling. What about Seattle? Uh, uh, I think they're, they're blank. blank. <laughs> um, because this is also based, so this is just based on, so in Yammer when you sign up it takes across your department and your office and some other things and, and a lot of times we find it doesn't come across and it's blank um, and you have to populate it again. Anyway, um, so um, we also notice customer care which I think is our sales guys in the most part is in that bracket, they're reasonably positive. Um, platform and tech are kind of also okay, so most people are, are you know, overall, as different departments are quite positive. It's mostly the blanks that are dragging us down, <laughs> <laughs> that, are, that are making it bad. Um, and it wasn't actually too hard to put this together, so... Um, if they can't be bothered filling out their department, then obviously. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, so I need to change my sentiment key again after I just did that, because it's recorded on the video. Um, but essentially, <laughs> you just write, um, I know it's kind of it's complicated, but essentially what, there's, there's a couple of things that you do initially to group your data together because you want to batch it into thousands and with a unique ID and then basically just send the text through using this. So all it's doing is it's taking a table of thousand chunks, um, convert it to a bit of JSON, so it's got this documents, um, JSON records thing, so it's actually just creating that documents batch that I'm sending through. And then it just calls that API in uh, West US, sends through my sentiment API key, and then I get back all the results. And then all I do in Power BI, because I've got the unique ID for every message um, that it's sending back, and then I just do a join of relationship in Power BI and say, join up the sentiment table with my original set of messages table, and then I just create graphs. Um, so pretty easy to do. Um, this is the, um, this is not though the recommend way of doing it. So this is just all the steps that I had to do to clean up my data, and then that's what I get back. So I get back the score, and then I get back the the original ID, and then just um, but when I run this, of course, it calls the API every time for every row <laughs> in this, right? So I've just used up a thousand of my free calls um, by doing it. And then if you're going to run it all the time, if you do it over Yammer data, Yammer data is just going to get more and more. And every time you run a report and refresh the data, you'll end up like using all of your API up. So you probably, if you're going to do something like this, you might test it to work out, is this you know, working for me? If it is, then you might pre-process it at the back end and populate your data with the sentiment rather than doing it on the fly in Power BI. But it worked really well for a demo. Um, and if you're just trying it out, then, then it's great because you can use the free one. And I think it's, and it's weird the way it says, like, I've got 10,000 calls that I can make to the API. And just using this data I sh in batches of thousands, I should have used up um, some, probably half of that. But I've actually only used up 80, um, which I can't work out. So it must be 80 times I've refreshed 1,000 is actually what it is. So it's actually 1,000 times 10,000 the way it calculates it. So you're getting more free stuff than, than you thought. Um, so that's Power BI, so that, that one's quite good. Um, and all the text analytics stuff. Um, now other ones you can do from a front end, so let's look at Q&A Maker. So um, if you go to Q&A Maker.ai, um, you can go and sign up for a free account, right? Um, and what you do is you create a new service and you can have um, lots of services, but the service is really just a definition of a an FA, a particular FAQ, right? So this one I created as a, an example FAQ around the Azure Bootcamp, right? So what you do is just simply put in a URL and say, I want to point this at this FAQ web page over here, um, which would be on your public website or some other one, and it will create you a bot um, that you can use and, and an API endpoint to actually go and um, you know complement your own website. Um, or add into um, your own bot as well. So by default, um, you um, if you just um, get it pointed at the URL, so that I pointed at this Azure Bootcamp frequently asked questions for organizers, and then it creates this sort of key value pair 
um, that's the start point. And then you can go in and start teaching it, well, you could also ask that question this way, and it starts teaching itself other ways that you could ask the same question to get the same answer. Right? Um, and then you can also add blank ones in, so you can add your own new key value pairs. So you don't even have to point it in an FAQ, you could just manually go in and put question answer, question answer, question answer. <laughs> Right? or just complement missing data. Um, but then it gives you this great little testing tool. So you, you save it and retrain it. So you can see I haven't retrained in 90 days because I'm, there's no updates to the content. And then it gives you a little bot. Um, so this is like a little chat bot. It says, hi, I can go, when is the Azure Bootcamp on? Oh, it's on, good question. <laughs> There's many more causes causes that. No, it's not right. <laughs> so you can say that's not the right answer, but that is the right answer, which is the all around the world, and they're running on this date. Cool, that was the answer I wanted. So you go in and you kind of ask it questions and then point out which are the correct answers. And if you don't have any answer, then you probably need to add a new key value pair until eventually you kind of answered as many questions and many ways of asking as you can think of. And then you save and retrain it again. So if I ask that same question, or a similar question, so I don't even have to ask it the same way, right? I could just say, when is the boot camp on? I don't even need to say the word Azure then, or when is the camp on, or, or what dates can I attend, or something like that, and it'll work it all out based on um, some language, natural language stuff that it does. Um, so you can, this is great, because then you can kind of work out whether it's all nice and working well. And then you then um, publish it out so you go to publish and publish it as an API that you can then add to your own um, piece of software. So you can put it in your website, you know, so if someone types a question, go to the Q&A and just come back and show a, you know, a potential result. Rather than people using a traditional search engine that more just searches by keywords, you know, this is more using kind of intent of what you were trying to search for and discover an answer. So, cool one Q&A maker. Um, that's not yet, that's still in preview. And then you got Lewis. Um, so Lewis is L-U-I-S dot A-I, um, stands for Language Understanding Intelligence, something um, that I can <laughs> never remember, but it really doesn't matter. Um, so what you're doing here, you create apps, right? Um, I have no idea what the Katana pre-built apps are, I haven't even ever gone into that, but you can create Katana pre-built ones, play away if you want. Anyway. I created um, our company assistant, so I'm going to go here. Um, so the concept here was, what if I could create a, a helper bot for doing common things that people do in organizations, but I need people to be able to ask natural questions and go, um, I want to go on leave. And they go, cool, you want to take some leave? Um, well, you need to tell me when, and then the person go, oh, between these dates, you go, where are you going? Do you want me to book you some travel? So kind of like as if you were phoning the company um, help desk or, or whatever it is, but it basically answers it but as a bot. So what I did is I went, well, what are the things that um, I actually want people to be able to ask? And these are what we call intents. So these are the things that people might be intending to do when they talk to my bot. So they might be intending to book some leave, put in an expense claim, um, find a person, do some travel booking or, or wish for something. And then what you do is for each of these, you put in what they call utterances. So this is again the same as the kind of Q&A maker, you're just saying, here's a way that someone might um, ask to book leave, right? And this is where you've got to do a bit of research, right? You've got to go around to people and ask them, how would you book leave? Yeah, we sit in passports, we get people, well, I've got my passport the other way. Yeah. That'd be a really good one to check in. Yeah, yeah. So you can just go, oh, I forgot my password. Oh, cool. Oh, but you might have to be signed in to use the bot. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, something like that. Yeah, um, you can have a public bot that help people as well. Go to a Azure AD endpoint. Oh, yeah. Or yeah, walk yeah. up to a camera, it yeah. recognizes you, and then you say, I want to reset my password. Yeah. yeah. And, and now you've said it now, and, and it's recorded, these are all my ideas. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so, um, or you might say, I've been off, or I want to take a whatever it is, or I want to book, or I need to record some leave that I'd already taken, you know, because you might not want to do in the future. You might be off sick, and then you come back to work, and you go, I was off yesterday, I need to book some sick leave. 
um, and it kind of then handles the process. But the great thing is it also recognizes things like um, dates in here and the type of leave. And these are entities. So I don't, it recognizes, um, if I said I want to book off a particular date or um, a particular time in July, or you can say in this one, for instance, I was off sick yesterday, and it will go, well, that's a date. Um, and the thing that um, you do with this is when it comes back to your bot or your code that you've written, you go, oh, okay, well, the intent is that they, they, were, they were actually off, um, I want to take leave, I know that's now what they want to do, but it also tells me it's because they were sick, and it was yesterday, so I know the date and everything else. So now I don't need to ask the user, what date was that? Because mm -hmm. um, I already know that. And I don't need to ask them what type of leave did you take because I already know that answer. So you kind of shortcut the process, right? Um, so Ernie Zinner must have done something like this to go. I'd like to travel from Auckland to Wellington on Friday morning. Don't use any New Zealand spoilers. Exactly. No, no. It's, just it's a terrible really, example. It's terrible. Yes. Because <laughs> they didn't lose Lewis, they used Skyscanner's something else. Skyscanner's got a really good one. Oh, is it? Yeah, Skyscanner, which you can plug into Skype. Yeah. Hmm. Um, then you create entities. So I created entities around expense types. Um, how do you get the list? Oh, <laughs> edit somewhere. Anyway. Um, and then you can say detect the language. I also had skills that you can detect because you can search for somebody with a particular skill. Um, different types of leave. And then you can add some of these pre-built ones like date times, encyclopedias, and geography. Um, now, I noticed with geography, though, that I actually went in when I was trying to teach the bot to go, hey, I'd like to book off, um, I'd like to book accommodation in Auckland. And it went, Auckland, uh, US, some other location. <laughs> so um, be careful with geography. It's, it's US geography, and you might need to create your own geography definition of places in, in New Zealand. Ah, well, um, depending on where you are, you can go fetch a location first and narrow it down to huh. the country. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, and then, um, yeah, anyway, so you can play around with it. Um, the dashboard sort of tells you everything that's been going on, so how many utterances and of different types. And also, as, um, and then eventually you teach it and train it and then publish the API. So once you've, once you've gone in and sort of started to, um, you can go train and test, um, you can go, I would like to book a trip to Seattle <laughs> tomorrow. It thinks I want to book leave, most likely, 0.25. Um, because actually I didn't put the word trip in my list of um, the possible types of um, travel. So it's only partly sure. And that's something else you need to decide. Like, all right, you see it recognized tomorrow as a date time. Um, actually, it should have recognized Seattle as a place. <laughs> um, anyway, um, but you need to go, well, is 0.25 good enough for me to actually think that they were booking leave? Probably not, which means you might need to retrain this a bit more. Because you'd want it to be above 0. Point, we found 0. 0.8. Oh. Is you're pretty sure that that's what they wanted to do. Right? Anything lower than 0. 0.8, you're like, mm, they might not want it to do that. Right. So that's um, that's Lewis. So this is a um, so that's how you sort of hook up to a bot. So for a bot, what you do is someone type a question, which is essentially that. You pass it through to Lewis. Lewis tells you, I think this is what they wanted to do. Here's the entities, and then your bot can carry on. And in the background, you're analyzing the sentiment of that conversation as you go along and say, you seem to be getting annoyed with talking to me. <laughs> Line up. Do you have Skype consumer on there? Uh, no. No, okay. no. You can You can access a bots directory on Skype consumer, and there's a really good one on there, which is the Skyscanner bot, which you can book travel between places and dates oh. and, and the rest of it. And uh, it does a really good job of understanding stuff. Yeah. And they probably use that. They do indeed. Yes. We're yeah. using um, Lewis at Powerpoint to we built a, a bot in front of our services. Keys. Oh, you did? And we published it through Teams and Skype and Tune. Cool. So you've got an attempt yeah. that says problem, and then the solution is turn it on and off again. Is it fucked in? It's easy to try. <laughs> Oh, that's good. Yeah, that's a really good example. The most incredible thing about it is how fast you can deliver something and very functional. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's yeah. astounding how... I mean, actually building the bot framework and stuff at the back 
for the Azure Bootcamp, we just created a quick um, example that just would call the Lewis and then make decisions based on the intents that come yeah. back. Yeah. Um, and like literally, the students just picked that up and made their own little bot and put in some other intents and stuff. So. Yeah, the for like the field engineers, so we've got tickets to go ahead for day. If you put that to like educational, like when I was at Wintech, they used to get hundreds of phone calls a day. People wanted to reset passwords. Yep. Universities and polytechnics would love something like that. If you had a thing that could brace up in a Azure, you know, whatever. Yeah, thanks for that. I'll go and talk to. <laughs> 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 anyway, yeah. um, now the um, university came in for a hack fest there around building some bots. So to wrap up, wrap up, we're gonna we're gonna do a little experiment to win a prize. Um, so this bit of code um, does a lot. It actually captures the image. Um, so this is all this code is doing is capturing your face. Um, and then basically what it does is when you say get my emotion, this is this is the only lines of literally it's one line of code that you send the actual image through, um, and then it returns you a contract of emotions um, as a score. <laughs> And then, yeah, don't ask me, this is programming stuff. This is like, how would you call it that? Oh, right. Anyway, um, and then you go, oh, I'll change my score, I'll make it, and this is me doing like formatting of it to make sure it actually looks correct. But it basically comes back with the sadness, surprise, and fear, and the anger, and stuff like that. And then I just write it into the page. So, um, very small, there's my API key again if you want to borrow it. Um, <laughs> I have to go and reset all these later. <laughs> oh, someone's going to use yeah. up all my. Just go and create your own one for free. Yeah, yeah, create your own. Don't use mine, it's free. Yeah. Um, just anyone else who's on YouTube who's watching this. Right, so, um, so you take a picture. Um, I tried doing an angry face during the demo last time. And I can't do angry faces, apparently. Tip it so you don't get the light in the background, maybe. Yeah, it's up. <laughs> so, uh, um, so that's just using the, all of that code is like just, just the bit of cat. It's just using the camera on the thing. So it's actually more code to do that than there is to actually pull the emotion. <laughs> um, anyway, um, I actually got this. Um, I should probably mention that there's actually a video on Channel 9 that the guy walked through actually doing all of this. So if you search for it, you'll, um, I'll, I'll, I think I've got the uh, URL in here. Um, so I just followed his instructions. There was like a couple of lines of code that were a bit wrong. but. Um, and he didn't reformat. Really anyway, so then you go check your emotion. Hey. Oh, I'm mostly well, happy again. I'm a bit surprised. surprised. <laughs> Marley, <laughs> surprised. And I, you know what I think it is? It can tell that I'm, I'm pretending. Um, so, um, so my, <laughs> we're going to have a bit of a competition to win this digital workplace thing um, as to um, who can get the biggest happiness score. Happiness. Oh, oh, come on, just look different. What are we going for? Can you, can you it tell me what, how many hours you sleep? <laughs> uh, that'll be neutral. Well, you might be angry by that point. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, so we've got to have a vote then. On, um, so we're going to get three people from the audience to come up, and they can use my little app. And they've got to try and make a score of one of these. Uh, let's go for oven and happiness, because it's obviously too easy. <laughs> um, so what does it want to go for? Fear. Fear? fear is going to be a hard You want to try yeah. fear? Fear. Let's <laughs> right. some scared faces. So who wants to go to the digital workplace conference? We'll start with that. One. Anyone else? The volunteers. You can do a good fear. Oh, you want to go? Anyone else? So the 23rd oh. of May, right? A thousand bucks. A thousand bucks for the tickets. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just got to pull a face. And, and yeah, yeah. three. Right, three, cool. Three, three. will come up. <laughs> Is there any disclaimer about sharing these photos and social media? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. No. <laughs> right. So what we do, so you got to do your best fear yeah. face. What do, you, what do you, do you do? Fear of spiders? Fear of heights? <laughs> Just think of that. Fear of public speaking. Fear of public speaking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. all about yourself. Right. Um, <laughs> so if you if you come in front of my, my camera, so just yeah, and then do your best. So if you want to, yeah. yeah. So look at there and you. Oh, yeah. okay. Then try your best um, fear <laughs> face. <laughs> that might come out neutral. We'll give it a go. 
Oh, 0.026. Yeah. So you gotta be you gotta be 0 point no no two six. That's probably a surprise. Surprise. You didn't have surprise? Oh break it again. Not clear? Probably, yeah, probably not enough lights on the face. Not clear. Sorry, you know, take that oh. again. It was good. Maybe come a bit closer. Yeah. Right there? Yeah. Right there. Oh, no, it'll probably do. If it doesn't work again, I'll restart the app. I've gone too far. Someone hacked your key. Uh, no, someone hacked <laughs> my key. <laughs> 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 credit. Wait, wait, wait. We'll just reset it. we come back in. Third attempt. If it doesn't work now, we'll give it to the first person. <laughs> <laughs> or we'll just have we'll just have a manual vote. <laughs> right. Dip the camera so that lights on in the photo. Oh right now. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. then you'll have to crouch down a bit. But. Yeah. Yeah. We can probably crop it in a bit. That might help. Please. Hey. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> no point. No two. Five. That's, that's winning. It's winning. I think so. <laughs> right. Two zeros instead of three. <laughs> There's obviously an issue with my code. It means you need to restart it. I'm not, a, I'm not a programmer. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a good plagiarist. Um, a good garbage collection, eh? Yeah, garbage collection mm -hmm. somewhere. It's fine. There you go. A bit better loading. Oh yeah. My quick demo there obviously shows that it does it does work. <laughs> <laughs> and that it can detect emotions, you just gotta uh, be good at pulling faces. Um, I'm obviously not as good at pulling faces. Um, so you can see, like, yeah, you could use it um, to analyze all sorts of different things. Mostly surprised, but come on. Slightly different. <laughs> Very surprised. Good point, nice call. You definitely go, yeah, it's probably that. So again, you'd probably go through all of the settings and go, which one's over 0 0.8 and go right it's one of those and then probably store that as the likely um, the emotion that the person likely had um, because you're not going to go everyone coming by here's your emotion here's your emotion <laughs> um, you're more just trying to um, use that data in some way right um well that concludes my my last little bit of of demo and um, we'll need your details to um yeah, make sure you tell them your name and all that so you can get your ticket yeah if you've got a business card that'll be really good no, not many people have business cards these days. Um, so just one last thing to kind of sort of say, you know, kind of how this pulls together. Um, so essentially, oh, it's quite blurry. So from a user's perspective, um, the way you're going to use, if you use like Lewis as the, as the kind of um, cognitive services API, this is how it fits with a bot, right? Um, now essentially, the a bot itself is only the max of bot that is kind of down, down here. It's not the channel that you use it through. So you can actually write your own web app and write your own bot and all of the code to, you know, for the person to interact and how you want to display that. So you don't have to display it like a messenger thing. You could display it however you want. Um, but you can then hook it into any of these channels, like so, um, Facebook and Skype and te Teams, that, as you've got it. Um, so all of those are, are the channels that you consume the bot through. Right? Um, Facebook's really tricky. <laughs> we actually got it published through Facebook, one of them, and um, you have to actually put it in, you have to create a page, you have to get X number of people to like you um, before you, they will even sort of register it as a bot that other people might want to use, which makes testing really hard. And we had to go, can we just get everyone in provoked to like this page? And you can't use your existing page because it uses the image from your Facebook as the image for the um, messenger guy. So you kind of can't really use um, your Facebook page 
for your normal company page because your bot will look like that when you talk to it. Um, so, and, and also when it appears in the list of bots you can talk to, it uses whatever the page, your current page images. Um, it's and very, very easy to test with Skype. Yes, yes, much easier to test with Skype. But we wanted to do it through Facebook. Um, but, um, and then, um, but then you can do things like, um, you know, we, we have Facebook have a way of sort of offloading. So if you want to do secure login to then go consume other services, they've got a way of actually hooking the two together, which is pretty good. So you can offload to a web page, person signs in, comes back, and then now authenticated with a unique code for that particular stream. So that particular conversation that we're having. So you can use that as an authentication mechanism, which is quite good. Um, and then just adding encryption to some of those calls, which weren't all encrypted, we discovered, which wasn't good. Um, now the, um, so then essentially what you do is the channels are calling through REST to actually the bot um, connector. So this is really the whole framework that Microsoft provides. So you don't have to do all the hooking it all up. You just kind of say, here's the channels. I want to publish it through this channel. Here's where my bot is. And you kind of just um, register the service. And you don't have to worry about translating or hooking it up as to who's talking to who now. Kind of the whole thing's just handled by that, that um, framework. And then this is the bit of code that you write, it's just your own little bot service, which is just written in C sharp, or you can even write it in JSON. Um, and that's just the thing that's sitting there responding to what people are saying. And then in the back end of that, that's where you'd call Lewis, or QA Maker, or Text Analytics, or any of the other cognitive services, and then pull it all together as a, as a bot that responds to um, request the reset by password. Mm. All right, um, and that was it, because there's, there's no, you don't need to do a lab. <laughs> but by all means, I, I'll put this up so it's got some links and stuff like that in it, and but I'll just go on the cognitive services and have a play around and um, upload your picture and see, see how surprised it thinks you are. Yeah, yeah there you go. Thank you, thank did, you. Did we, uh, did I miss the facial white gang people? Yeah, you like? did. <laughs> you can watch it again on YouTube oh, well, later, oh, can't oh. you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, we managed to get someone who was really, uh, yeah, more surprised, but it did give a higher fear score, the highest fear score. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Cool. So, are we going to do the polls, or we don't need to do the polls? Oh, um, we have pushed out the polls. I don't know if um, many of you have um, answered. There were a few answers there. I did notice that I pushed out the second poll, and it didn't appear until I refreshed the screen. So, yeah, I guess I'm still figuring that <laughs> as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's cool. Oh, let me see. Can we get that those results up? Have you finished? You, you wrap up. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll wrap up. I'll wrap up. <laughs> <laughs> so wrapping up, we're done. Um, yeah, but thanks, thanks all for coming. Um, we do have a couple of um, speakers lined up, or, or, or sort of um, uh, wooing us, and we wooing them. But we still put out that that uh, invite to to you that uh, if you if you want to jump up and say what you've been working on for ten minutes or so, um, we really encourage that. We're not a scary bunch. Um, yeah. Do you want to show your um, data com bot? That'd be quite cool. That'd be awesome. Yeah. If you're allowed to. Yeah, we'll have to find out. Yeah. All right. Pre-recorded session. Yeah. Simulated. Virtual. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how many tickets we have. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, that's true. That's true. Uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, but them. thanks all for coming. Um, do do keep an eye on the meetup um, as you do uh, for the next session. Um, we'll try and get it out within the next two weeks. Mm -hmm. Seems to work that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yeah, thanks thanks um, Regan for for uh, watching us too. Yes. We'll see you in June. See you again. Thank you. Oh, you did? Oh, yeah. Sorry, bye. Thank you. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah